her two-year investigation into how police and the courts handle sexual assault cases in Canada resulted in the award-winning series Unfounded, published in the Global Mail. That was not the end of it for Robin Doolittle. With the Me Too movement breaking, she recognized many of the same themes and attitudes. Her new book outlines what she found. It's called Had It Coming, What's Fair in the Age of Hashtag Me Too. And Robin Doolittle joins us now for more. Hi, welcome back. Hi, thank you to be here. It's very nice to meet you in person. Mm -hmm. um, your book is fantastic. Um, a lot of uh, things that I didn't know. Um, and I guess you That's write it, the process of you writing this book, because you did the series Unfounded, but why did you choose to write about the Hashtag Me Too movement? I mean, I'd spent more than two years totally immersed in this topic when Me Too went viral. And I thought, uh, oh, this is great that everyone is now going to start thinking about these rape myths and stereotypes that I had been constantly thinking about since 2015. Um, I kind of thought I had my mind made up on, on all of these issues. And then as stories kind of started coming out around Me Too, I realized it, it wasn't as as simple as I thought. There was one particular story that really gave me uh, a push to write this book, which was the Aziz Ansari story. I don't know if you recall, mm -hmm. this is the, the comedian. comedian, famous for being you know, woke. He's an ally of women. He wore the Time's Up pin to the Golden Globes after the Harvey Weinstein scandal. And uh, if you recall, the story was this woman, Grace, had essentially accused him of badgering her for sex uh, and sexual acts after a date. And she acknowledges that she didn't say anything. She gave, quote, nonverbal cues that she wasn't interested. Um, and I wasn't really sure how to take it. I mean, she classified it as a sexual assault. And it was interesting. I texted a bunch of my friends, and I was like, is this really a Me Too story? I felt bad for Aziz that he was kind of being publicly shamed in this way. Uh, when it, it seemed kind of this is a confusion around consent issue. And my friends and I had such a great discussion about it. Uh, they really kind of pushed me to see that, no, this is exactly the kind of conversations we need to have. These are the real um, situations that most women can relate to. Mm -hmm. And what struck me was, one, uh, that this was such a great conversation I had with my friends, that, that I learned a lot and, and evolved, even if I didn't necessarily change my thinking. But I also realized I was never going to have that discussion uh, outside of my very close friend group. For example, on Twitter. But it, why, why the trepidation around that? Twitter is just not a place that you can have kind of complicated conversations. You're, you're really afraid of someone just latching onto a single sentence and taking you out of context. Or maybe you, you have a question that's a bit controversial, like, mm. is this really a Me Too story? You can see people immediately pulling out their pitchforks and wanting to drag you off. Um, when you had the conversations with your friends, uh, what did you learn that you weren't sure about before? Yeah, I think, like, for me, because I'd spent so much time uh, looking at the criminal justice system and thinking about these issues in a purely illegal context, uh, when this woman, uh, Grace, I mean, journalistically, there was a lot of problems with that story. So I'll, I'll put that as kind of a, on the side just to think about. But mm -hmm. um, when Grace said she felt that she'd been sexually assaulted, uh, and when, it, when, upon my reading of, of the story, that it was more that she just felt she didn't want to be there, but she didn't say anything, she didn't know how to leave. This is more of a, she'd been socialized to be agreeable. This is a different issue. Um, it's not a legal or criminal. It's not criminal. a legal issue, yes. Yeah. And I was thinking about it purely in the legal sense. Mm -hmm. And it made me realize, no, like, what we really need to do with Me Too is stop obsessing about the legal system and think about these things more from an ethical and a moral one. It's not illegal to badger someone into having sex with you if, if they're ultimately agreeing. Um, and, but and this had huge repercussions for him and for a lot of other um, men. Um, and in some situations, rightfully so. Um, and, and also, in the interest of full disclosure, you also interviewed our host, Steve uh, Pakin, mm -hmm. who had allegations leveled at him. When you were uh, working on this book, did you find most people, men in particular, were open to talking to you about this? I think there's I, a lot I, of hesitation among men right now talking yeah. about this. And it gets back to a bunch of things. One of them is the fact that I think they're not sure that where they fit into the movement. They want to be, you know, at least the men in my life, like they want to be supportive, uh, but they aren't sure maybe that if they should be speaking. And or, are they also worried about how people will receive them or, or the blowback? The, and then there's the other element of what if they say the wrong thing? What if they ask an honest question and it gets taken out of context? And this gets back to the fact that 
you know, social media is not a safe space to have complicated, nuanced discussions, and we have to figure out how to do that. I think a lot of the men that I interviewed um, for the book have real concerns about where they fit, and we need to figure out how to bring them in. And part of that uh, is acknowledging and discussing some of the fears that they have. The fear of being falsely accused is very real. I've now been doing book events for two weeks, and this question comes up like over and over again, whether I'm on talk radio or whether it's at an event, that, well, what do you say to, to people who are making false accusations? Well, your book um, starts with a really interesting um, uh, story illustrating what rape culture is. When the story broke that basketball superstar Kobe Bryant had been accused of rape, what was your initial reaction? This seemed like the right place to start the book because I spend a lot of time asking people to think about rape myths and stereotypes. These are the outdated ideas that we all carry around with us about women and power and sex and gender and, and what real victims are going to do in a, in a situation. Um, and again, I thought I had my mind made up when I was working on Unfounded, but then I, as, I, as I, you think more, you, it's uncomfortable to admit these these beliefs lie in you and why is it uncomfortable i think we don't like to see ourselves in a in a negative in a negative way we always want to think that oh we're on the right side mm -hmm. and then when i was doing my research i came across the kobe bryant case again and i read it and i was like oh my god like there was a, those charges were withdrawn i should mm -hmm. say uh, and he apologized um but there was a civil suit but, right? but he didn't admit guilt there was mm -hmm. a civil suit and a settlement um, but there was a lot of evidence in that case. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, a 19-year-old hotel staffer who uh, alleges that he raped her and choked her in a hotel room after she gave him a tour of the hotel. And I remember being 18 and hearing about that case, and my first thought was, well, what did this woman think going to a hotel room at night with an NBA player? Like, what did she think was going to happen? Mm -hmm. And as an adult now, looking back on that, going like, where did that come from, that that was my instinct? This girl was practically my age. I also worked in a hotel at that point. Um, the treatment that she uh, was handed from the press was, was crazy. The headline in the LA Times was essentially, um, Kobe's accuser mm -hmm. is uh, an emotional party girl. Um, Kobe Bryant, of course, is, is an all-star basketball player, in case mm -hmm. people aren't following the NBA. Mm -hmm. But um, the court staff leaked confidential information about her sexual history to reporters by accident. Um, the, the treatment that she went through, I just thought, was such a perfect example of how to introduce people to this concept of rape culture. Now, as an adult and having done the work that you did, um, you're the same age. You think back, you're the same age as Kobe Bryant's accuser, and you could identify with her, and yet, you didn't believe her. Um, why are we apt to not believe women when they come forward? This is the question we're trying to unpack in this movement and that I'm trying to unpack in this book. I think this rape, rape culture, this is the system where we are suspicious of women, suspicious of sexual assault complainants, and we want to make excuses for, for the people who are doing harm, is so woven into our culture that you don't even notice it. But you also say that it's, it's um, historically, it's been there. How far back does it go? It goes back to the Bible. I mean, like, let's think about Adam and Eve. Um, there's, a, there's a story in the Bible about a woman falsely accusing um, a, a slave in her home uh, of rape. Like, this is like biblical in nature, this mistrust mm -hmm. of women. Um, and where does it come from? I mean, these are just the classic rape myths that, you know, that if, if a woman has had sex before, it's, it's not as bad uh, to have sex again, that she's kind of walking around as damaged goods. She's in a constant state of consent, that um, women are not to be trusted, mm -hmm. that, that women's words can, are, are, are taking down men around the world. And that's where, where we're hearing, I think, that fear of, for men continues to persist today. Mm -hmm. And legally, too, it's been there, too, right? The legal question is such an interesting one because when I started doing this work, I didn't realize it, but Canada has some of the most progressive sexual assault laws in the world, mm -hmm. and yet the system, the feeling is that it's not working. You know, in Canada, we have an affirmative consent standard, so it's not about saying no, it's about indicating yes. We have laws that prevent um, a woman's 
uh, or a complainant's sexual history from being introduced. This gets back at addressing that rape myth about an unchaste woman. We have um, legal decisions on the books uh, that, that are very clear that rape myths and stereotypes have no place in our courts. You don't have to fight back in, to be sexually assaulted in Canada. You don't have to scream for help. You don't have to report right away. A judge can convict without outside corroborating evidence. All of these things are, are meant to address these biases that exist in our society. But the problem is that the laws are great, but if people aren't um, getting rid of these outdated ideas in their heart, they're not going to enforce the laws. And that's, I think, what's happening. Well, uh, me Too uh, was around what happened with Harvey Weinstein. But in Canada, we kind of had a seminal hashtag Me Too movement, didn't we, before? Yeah, the point, a, a point I try to make over and over again in the book is some people talk about Me Too like it sort of just dropped out of the sky in October 2017 with the Harvey Weinstein investigation and the Alyssa Milano tweet. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is that we've been marching towards this moment for a very long time. Um, Gian Gomeshi, of course, is, I think, the first cracks that you were seeing of this, this cultural reckoning happening. And that was 2014. Um, the, uh, the Bill Cosby case, um, those allegations about Bill Cosby had been around for years, but something uh, um, about the way that we were primed in the culture made it possible for that story to really outrage people right now. Why is that? Um, and you I, say social media played a big role in I that. think social media is, it, it, because I looked at the case of, um, for example, Nova, former Nova Scotia Premier Gerald Regan, who'd been accused of sexual assault, very serious allegations by many women, beginning back in the 19, like going back decades and decades, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, his trial was in the 90s, going into the 2000s. The people debating that case and having a voice on it were really a lot of, you know, older white men in legacy newspapers. Um, one columnist in the National Post basically said, like, a man's ability to get a fair trial in this day and age is akin to a Jew getting a fair trial in Nazi Germany. Like, this is kind of the opinions that we were hearing. Social media opens up that platform to everybody. Everyone can have a voice. And I think that's what we were seeing with Gian Gomeshi, mm. is this is the first time people were discussing some of these bigger issues about the legal system and about victim blaming and about how hard it is for sexual assault complainants to come forward. So it sounds like social media is good and bad, but we'll talk more about that um, later. Um, what does the term unfounded mean? So it's such a tricky t way to explain it, but basically when I started uh, doing this unfounded investigation with the Globe and Mail, what I was essentially trying to do is figure out if you can quantify rape culture. Is there a way to prove that the justice system or police were treating sexual assault complaints differently? And I ended up focusing up on this one statistic, which is the unfounded rate. So when police investigate a case, um, at the end of it, they give it a code to signify what happened for statistical purposes. One of those codes means we've charged someone, or the complainant didn't want to press charges, or we couldn't find, or like the, we have diplomatic immunity. There's all sorts of different codes. One of them is unfounded. And unfounded means that this accusation um, is false or baseless. Uh, so, you know, someone makes an accusation of sexual assault and the officer says, I don't think that this happened. It's not that there wasn't enough evidence. It's not that they couldn't find a suspect. It's that it's an invalid accusation. Um, and what's key about that is because it's invalid, it's, it wasn't being counted at all. It was just completely disappearing out of the system. Mm -hmm. And what I found was that one in five sexual assault complaints was being completely scrubbed from the public record which and is way higher than any other crime. More than, you know, about double for regular physical assault, but dramatically higher than every other type of crime. I mean, the legwork that you did for this was incredible, and for the series that you did for Global Mail, you had to uh, do freedom of information. You had to send letters to all the yeah. police divisions across the country. Yeah, we had to collect statistics from more than 870 police jurisdictions. Uh, um, when you did that, and you were deep, uh, digging deeper into these unfounded cases, how did you find that police handle these uh, sexual assault cases? So I collected the statistics, but you know numbers don't really mean things to people until you have a human connection. So I also investigated 54 specific complaints of sexual assault. And what I found was whether the case ended up unfounded or not, uh, sexual assault investigations were just being systemically mishandled by police in, in, in a lot of cases. So basic investigative steps like collecting surveillance, interviewing witnesses, trying to find a suspect, sending um, evidence away for forensic testing, 
was not being done routinely. I, I watched many police interviews of, of complainants where they made a decision before the end of the interview. Is on, there a reason they did that? Yeah, I, and I think this comes back to one of the big things that I write about in the book, which is um, how complainants are presenting in these police interviews. Police are not well informed, or at least they weren't when I was doing this work, mm -hmm. on the impacts that a really terrifying experience, a traumatic experience, can have on somebody. Um, this is uh, what, what we're calling now the neurobiology of trauma. Mm -hmm. And it's this idea that if you're really truly terrified for your life, you're going to um, perhaps freeze because you're so afraid. Maybe you can't scream. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to be processing this event differently. You're going to be remembering it differently than you would if, if say, you weren't uh, truly terrified. You're going to be focusing on the really central details of an attack, not the color of the walls. Um, this is something that goes against the way that police are, are trained on how to do their investigations. Mm -hmm. They're really focused on these peripheral details. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a big part of overcoming rape myths and stereotypes is understanding the biological reasons that someone may act in a logical behavior. Like, why wouldn't you scream if, mm -hmm. if you're really scared? Right, so when the police officers were investigating the claimants, they might not act in the way they thought someone would act if they had been assaulted. Yeah, and I think that's really important because, you know, when I was interviewing these police officers, they weren't bad people, mm -hmm. right? I think they just had, honestly weren't sure what to make of some of these situations. Like, mm -hmm. if you're interviewing uh, a sexual assault complainant and you say, okay, tell me what happened, and they're like, kind of wishy-washy, they, they uh, the police are trained to, you know, start from the beginning, go to the end. If they're not really sure where to pick up, if they seem, um, you know, just com confused by what happened. They're like, I don't know what to think about this. Or if someone says, um, well, you're being sexually assaulted. What did you do? I don't know. Like, why didn't you scream? I, I don't know. Why didn't you run? There were people outside. I I'm not sure. Why did you stay in a room with him after it was over and he went to sleep? Well, I, I don't know. You can see why an officer, if they're not informed about the way that trauma can impact a, a victim, well, they might think, like, this just doesn't seem true. From all the research that you did, um, why do the courts have such a tough time grappling with consent in sexual assault cases? I mean, sexual assault is such a tricky thing because almost always it is one person's word against another person's word. Um, and it all hinges on credibility. Um, there is no getting around that. They are going to be tricky cases. I think... Part of it is that there are great laws on the books that, mm -hmm. that courts aren't enforcing. And part of it is that these are just inherently difficult cases to deal with. That said, even cases where there is lots of evidence, mm -hmm. the courts do, don't always have a great record. Look at the case of the young woman in Halifax. This is a woman who was at a bar, was with her friends, got very drunk, was kicked out of the bar because she was so drunk, got picked up by a taxi driver. Within 10 minutes of leaving the bar, getting in the cab, a, a, a police officer happened to be walking by a street and noticed that this taxi was parked on the side of the road idling. And when she went up to the, the, the car, this poor young woman was um, passed out asleep. She'd urinated on herself because she'd been so intoxicated. She was naked from the chest down and had her feet up on the headrest. The driver was reclined in his seat and had his pants pulled down. A judge found that, well, it's possible she said she was interested in having sex with him before she passed out. Now, this judge, I mean, sure, we, we weren't in the cab. Mm -hmm. There's no video that, of that conversation. But logically, any woman, can you imagine being so drunk that you're about to pass out, you've urinated on yourself, you meet a stranger, and you decide that in the middle of the night you want to have sex with this strange taxi driver mm -hmm. in a span of 10 minutes. So these are the kind of things like, what is in that judge's uh, mind that that seems like logical behavior? Um, I want to quickly read a board from your book because we're running out of time. Um, and you write, I've encountered well-intentioned student activists at two large Canadian universities whose frosh presentations include warnings that consent must be sober. In addition to not being true in either the legal or the ethical sense, that's not realistic advice for many first-year university students. They may as well be pitching abstinence. Uh, what do consent educators get wrong? Consent is so central to everything that we talk about with Me Too. And unfortunately, 
the way that we as a society talk about consent is just completely setting us up for failure. In what ways? Think of any you know, ad you've ever seen about consent. It's no means no. But again, like, as I said, we have an affirmative consent standard. You don't have to say no. It's no surprise that so many police officers fixate on this question, well, did you say no? Um, you don't even have to verbally say yes. You just have to indicate yes. Mm -hmm. All of this conversation focuses on verbal negotiation. But what we know is most people don't have sex like that. Mm. They communicate through body language, and people aren't very good at uh, understanding other people's body language. Uh, we're going to continue the conversation, so just good. stay put so for a few more minutes. Yes. <laughs> uh, Robin's going to stay with us as we add more voices to this conversation, uh, so stay tuned. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.